My name is Alistair, and uh, for the next hour I'm going to monopolize your attention and hopefully tell you something useful and interesting. Um, I think we have a couple more people coming in, so uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions to get a sense of you guys. How many people here have started a company before? That's awesome. How many people here work in what you would describe as an enterprise company today? How many of you work in a small business? Less than 100 people? How about an agency that does stuff for others? How many of you have a dress code in the office? It's not a bad thing, it just it actually correlates very strongly with whether you have a mainframe in the basement, usually. So I like to know these things. So um, there's a few seats up front if you want to sit down. Um, so my name is Alistair. I'm the co-author of a book called Lean Analytics. Um, really quick background, I've been, I'm a Canadian, I live in Montreal. I look a little frazzled because at 5 a.m. I found out the porter wasn't flying here and I had to get on a train, so I've been up since pretty early. But I got here in time. Um, and uh, I have started a few companies here in Canada, uh, one of them called Coradiant that was acquired by BMC in 2011, uh, did web performance monitoring, and uh, it was a good exit for all of us. Um, not great for me, but really good for the investors, which is as it should be because it took us way too long to build the right product. Um, and so I kind of became obsessed with how to do what we did in less than 10 years and keep more of the money. And it turns out that the lean startup is the best way we know how to do that. Um, Eric Rees wrote a book called The Lean Startup. How many people have read it? Wow. Eric is doing very well. Um, he, every conference you go to, there's like a Lean Startup book on your, on your chair. So um, the problem with Lean Startup is that it tells you a lot about what you should do. It doesn't necessarily get into how. And if you've read The Lean Startup, this build, measure, learn cycle, um, it's actually very hard to find prescriptive stuff on what you should measure based on who you are, what stage you're at, what's good enough, and how to move forward. Um, I spend a lot of time working with data. The company that I uh, was involved with, Coradiant, um, was one of the user performance management companies out there, so we did a lot of work with analytics. And since that time, I help O'Reilly run a conference called Strata, which is the big industry conference on big data, uh, new interfaces, and ubiquitous computing. Ben and I were two of the four founders of an accelerator in Montreal called Year One Labs that we ran for one year. And uh, during that time, we learned and kind of honed a lot of this stuff. We ran it based on the Lean Startup methodology. And um, we spent a lot of time understanding how companies learn and what, what they should do at what stage um, and launched a few successful organizations out of that. Uh, one of them that was acquired by Airbnb last year called Local Mind. It was a great experience. Um, we also run a thing called the Startup Festival, the International Startup Festival in Montreal, or Startup Fest. Um, so all of that has kind of gone into this thinking. So what I'm going to do in the next hour is give you guys a sense of Lean Analytics. You've all got a book. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll virtually sign it for you. I'll, if you send me the digital file, I'll PDF encrypt it and send it back or something. I don't um, it's not quite the same, is it? Uh, so what I want to start out by saying is that the most important thing I learned about startups I learned from Kevin Costner. In fact, Kevin Costner is a lousy entrepreneur. Uh, everybody remembers Field of Dreams, right? If you build it, they will come. Uh, the real world is completely the opposite. It's if they come, you will build it. Um, if I were to tell you today that I'm about to build the next Facebook, I suspect that most of you don't believe me. How many people think here I'm going to build the next Facebook? How many people think it's because I can't build the technology properly? How many people think it's because no one will care? Right. The scarcest resource we have in our economy these days is attention. Um, we have a real problem with this. And that says that if I was trying to build a business like the next Facebook, then I probably shouldn't go build the product. I should probably build the audience first. Because the big risk, as you've all wisely stated, is that we won't necessarily have sufficient attention to grow the business. But many of us who grew up in a world of building companies and products and technology, we like to close the door and build stuff. And that's actually a horrible, horrible thing to do because the secret to good marketing is instead of trying to sell what you can make, try to make what you can sell, which requires that you learn what you can sell. So the reverse field of dreams model is correct. If, you, if they come, then you should build it because frankly, you can ask them what they want and you can measure what they do. And from that, you can learn what you should build. In the traditional world of analytics, we look at analytics as a way of measuring progress of your customers or users towards a goal you have in mind. This applies to everybody. Most people, when they see Lean Analytics, my mom, when she sees Lean Analytics, um, thinks that it's a book about um, measuring your weight so you can get healthy. And then she takes one look at me, and to quote Emo Phillips, my body is not a temple. It's barely even a well-maintained Presbyterian youth center. Um, <laughs> So uh, analytics for us is a little different. I'm going to give you an example that has nothing to do with startups. Uh, this is a restaurant a friend of mine owns in San Diego. His name is Randy Smerick. 
And the only tie he has to tech is that he started a bunch of companies. He was the general manager of Teradata once, and so he's very obsessed with numbers. But he's running an Italian restaurant. So I was hanging out with Randy over Christmas, and his son, Tommy, yells, hey, Randy, 24. And I'm like, OK, I got to know. I'm a metrics guy. What does that mean? He says, well, 24 is actually um, the ratio of the money we spent on staff to the cost of running the restaurant that night. If it's over 30, we probably spent too much money on staff. If it's under 20, we probably underserved our customers. And we can play around with that ratio. I could have fewer people working that night. That would lower the numerator. Or I could have, I could push higher margin stuff and bring in more revenue, which would increase the denominator. And that range of 20 to 30 is pretty good. 24 is actually kind of magic. He knows that for the industry. So that's a really good metric, right? And that actually works out to be a line in the sand for Randy. And he knows that if it's too high or too low, he can change things. He can put more expensive things on the menu. He can hire a few fewer people. He has another metric. The next night, his son sends him a mail at around 5.30 that says 50. And I said, what does 50 mean? He says, I've learned that in my business, I'm going to get about a 5 to 1 ratio. If I, have five, if I have a reservation at 5 PM, that will translate into five covers that night. It's true for my restaurant. It's not true for McDonald's. They have no reservations. It's not true for Daniel Boulud because they have 100% sold out. But for him, it's about 5 to 1. And that's really useful because it means at 5.30, he can call someone and say, could you come in? Or he can go out and get more food. It's a good leading indicator. So Randy runs his restaurant by these two metrics. Very few restaurateurs I know run their restaurant by metrics like this. If they do, they do it at best instinctively. Even fewer startups I know do this kind of disciplined monitoring. And it's not hard. And this is really simple stuff. These are basic metrics. So this idea of analytics, having very few metrics, clear lines in the sand, knowing the ratios, and driving your business based on those is a really good idea, but it's not a widespread idea. We tend to shoot from the hip and hope things will work. And if we're lucky, then we claim in hindsight that we were really good at analytics. In a startup, the world is a little different. In a startup, your job is not to find the perfect movement of your users by analytics. It's to figure out what to build by iterating through a variety of products and markets until you find the one that works before the money runs out. So I'm going to cover a few things. First of all, what makes a good metric? I'm going to talk a little about how to understand concepts like cohorts and segments, which aren't nearly as confusing as they sound. I'm going to tell you about something we call the cycle of lean analytics. I'm going to walk you through the stages of lean analytics that every company goes through. And then I'll tell you why it's so important to pick one metric that matters. Um, I'm a pretty vocal guy. You're all looking at me now. Hopefully, by the end of this, half of you will be tweeting how interesting this is, using my clearly displayed name. Um, but if you want to give me your undivided attention, that's nice, too. It's a little intimidating. I'm used to people basking in the glow of little screens, so all these eyeballs is a little frightening. Uh, five things you need to know about, about metrics. So when you're measuring stuff, whether you're measuring a restaurant, a Fortune 500 company, or a startup, there are five really important dimensions to keep in mind about metrics. The first is the difference between qualitative and quantitative data. Both are really important. Somehow we think that quantitative hard numbers are good and qualitative is bad. The reality is that unstructured anecdotal information early on in the software development process, in the startup development process, in the user interface development process, in any business, qualitative information is vital because that's where you get your inspirations from. The ideas come from qualitative and then you test them out quantitatively. If you prematurely try to quantify the information you're getting back, you will often overlook very important insights into markets. This data tends to be hard to aggregate. People try to put it into tag clouds. It's usually a bad idea. It's the stuff you need to go through by hand. Early in the life of a company, the only metric you should really be tracking is how many people you've talked to. As you grow, you care more about quantitative stuff, stats, surveys, data, and so on. But simply put, you can't count smiles. So you have to discover things qualitatively. There's a famous saying in the Lean Startup movement, get out of the office, pick up the phone. It's amazing what you can learn by actually talking to people. If you haven't talked to 30 people about your product, you probably haven't talked to enough people and you're building something that you and your mother will love and nobody else will. The second important dimension is the difference between exploratory and reporting metrics. If you're an investor or an advisor to a startup, you make a horrible mistake with this data because you ask for a lot of information and you shouldn't. You should ask for the, the information that matters. Exploratory metrics are the metrics that will show you unknown unknowns, unexpected things. Reporting metrics are the ones that tell you something you know you don't know. So for example, if I'm measuring sales for this quarter, I know I don't know sales. I know how to get it. I go measure it. That's nice, but it's not going to give me that epiphany that helps me under, uncover a new market. 
Steve Blank famously said that a startup is an organization designed to search for a sustainable business model. By definition, exploratory metrics are searching metrics. If you're asking people to give you a lot of reporting metrics, that gets in the way of exploration. Donald Rumsfeld, though you may not know it, was a genius at analytics. At least Avinash Kauzik, when he channels Donald Rumsfeld, says so. Um, Donald said things, because we're on a first name basis, me and Donald, things we know we know, and that's just facts, which we should probably check, but they're assumptions in the market. There's things we know we don't know, and those are questions like reporting, which we should translate, we should automate, we should delegate, we should find baselines, we should be alerted when they go out of the norm, but they're not really that useful for us growing and developing a business. There's metrics, there's things that we don't know we know, that's intuition. You as a founder may have worked in an industry for 20 years, you need to take that internalized knowledge and turn it into things the rest of the company can use to grow. But the most important stuff is exploration. This is where unfair advantages live. This is where those epiphanies that tell you that you should enter a new market come from. Another important dimension of metrics is the difference between vanity metrics and actionable metrics. Vanity metrics make you feel great, but they don't really help you. If a metric is actionable, it will help you pick a direction. Consider, for example, metrics like hits, not a very useful metric. Page views, visits, these are, you know, the 90s call, they want their metrics back. Unique visitors, eh, it's kind of nice, but it doesn't tell me whether they stuck around or anything. Followers, friends, I don't want followers. I want minions. I want followers that will do my bidding unquestioningly. I may be a little narcissistic. Um, time on site. I know a company that had an amazingly good time on site because everyone was on the support page. That's not a good metric, right? What are they actually doing? Emails collected. No, it's how many people can I reach reliably who will do what I say. And then number of downloads. In the App Store, that might be good, but for the most part, this is still a vanity metric. How many people try something out and become engaged and remain engaged for the duration? So the bottom line about metrics is if it won't change how you behave, it is a bad metric. This is a really, really important litmus test when you're collecting data. If the metric won't change how you behave, it's probably a bad metric. If your VC asked you for a metric that won't change how you behave, it's probably a bad VC. Let me give you an example of a good metric. Everybody knows Airbnb? So Airbnb um, had a hypothesis. They had an idea that if they had photographs of rental properties, those properties would be rented more. So they set up something called a curated MVP. MVP means minimum viable product. It's the least you can do to find out whether something's going to happen. They had a curated MVP, which means they made it look like there was a product there, but it was actually just people behind the curtain, kind of the Wizard of Oz model. So you'd go and fill in a form saying, I would really like photographs of my place. And then someone in the back would scramble around and find a photographer in your neighborhood and send them over and tell them they came from Airbnb and take pictures. Didn't cost them much to set up. And they built this concierge MVP, they rolled it out, and they found that after a very quick experiment, professionally photographed apartments on Airbnb rented two to three times as much as those that were taken by the owner. Huge, right? By late 2011, they had 20 full-time photographers on staff in major US cities, and you can see on this curve exactly where they added the photographers. They had a hypothesis. We think professional photography will improve revenues and rentals. They ran a test using the minimum amount of work possible. They collected the results, and they knew that if the results were above a certain line, they would make this a standard feature and go and hire a bunch of people. Turns out it was a really good decision. So a good metric will make you change your behavior. When you're in a startup, you're trying to figure out what business you're in. So most of your metrics that matter are going to be exploratory metrics, hypotheses, experiments. Very, very different from the standard go and get me the, uh, the TPS reports. All right, next metric. Imagine you are the mayor of a sleepy little New England town. So, you know, you are a bit of OCD and a little bit obsessive, so you track a lot of information. You track things like um, how, many uh, how many rental, ho uh, sorry, hotel vacancies you have, how many beach chairs you have, drownings, ice cream consumption, grains of sand, you're a little OCD and you track all this stuff, right? Um, and you might track, you know, tourism and all this kind of stuff over time, and you notice one day that you have an uncomfortable amount of drowning going on in your little sleepy New England town, and you've ruled out all the usual causes of drowning in sleepy New England towns of which you're the mayor. And then one of your people, also a little OCD, a little analytics obsessed, decides to crunch ice cream numbers and notices something really important. They notice there's this huge correlation between ice cream consumption and drowning. That's a really good thing to know. 
because now I can call up the funeral home and say, hey guys, there's a lot of rocky roads, you better dig a few plots. Or I can call up the ice cream parlor and say, there's been a tragic death, you maybe want to put some more ice cream on, 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 in the freezer, right? That might sound a little ridiculous, but that's what the correlation tells you. And actually, that's a fairly good thing. I mean, you can predict the behavior of one thing from another because of that correlation. What's really going on? So it turns out that there is a strong correlation in the real world between ice cream and drowning. And you should know it's really, really hard to find a picture on Flickr that includes the words Ciao Bella, ice cream, and a beach. I spend too much time on Flickr. But the correlation, as many of you may have already guessed, is that while ice cream consumption and drowning are correlated, they're both correlated with something called summertime. This is temperature, right? And that's much better because now I have causality and now I can do things like hire some CPR training, get a few lifeguards, or if I'm still obsessed with correlation, again, too much time on Flickr, I can locate my lifeguard station right next to the ice cream store. The reality is that correlated and causal metrics are very important. It's not that one is better than the other. I mean, causal is a little better, but they're both important. When you have a metric, it should either be correlated or causal to something in your business model you really care about. When Twitter first launched the Twitter app, they knew they were going to make money through advertising. They measured how many times someone looked at their feed. That sounds like a vanity metric, but they knew they were going to insert advertising in there. So that translated to number of ad impressions. So it wasn't a vanity metric, it was a prediction of how much ad revenue they get. It was correlated with the projected ad revenue. Very important for them because they could make business predictions from it. <coughs> If two metrics change together, they're correlated. In Canada, the use of winter tires is correlated with a decrease in accidents. Sound weird? Should we put winter tires on the cars in the summer? I mean, if winter tires cause less accidents, they're correlated. No. The problem is that there's all kinds of other factors. They don't cause those accidents. If you put winter tires on cars in the summer, they'll slide around on the hot tarmac. And you'll find that in the summer, the reason that people have so many accidents is a lot of kids driving, a lot of families going on vacation in unfamiliar neighborhoods, and so on. So the reality is that you want to um, understand the causes of, of bad driving, like teens driving, like vacation time, and fix that. If you get that wrong, you wind up doing crazy things, like enforcing people to put winter tires in their cars in the summer. Let me give you one more example of finding a cause. A few years ago, Houston Airport had a real problem. They had a lot of complaints about the slow delivery of luggage. People would get to the carousel and they'd have to wait on average eight minutes to get their luggage. Houston decided to fix this. They invested a ton of money in overhauling their baggage delivery services. They got it down to six and a half minutes. Complaints were still really high, did nothing. And then someone had an idea. They had the planes park further from the, the uh, carousels. So people were walking more, complaints went to zero. What was causing the complaints was the amount of time spent waiting, not the amount of time the bags came out. It would have been far cheaper for the guys in Houston Airport to say, let's try an experiment. Let's park a few planes further away, measure that, and see what that does to the complaints. And they would have discovered that actually people didn't like standing around, but walking was just fine. And they wouldn't have had to spend all that money. So when you're evaluating experiments, which experiment can be done quickly and easily, and how can you evaluate it? Turns out the long delivery in this case wasn't causing dissatisfaction, standing around was. Now I said earlier that a good metric is both correlated, is either correlated or causal. Causality is actually kind of a superpower because correlation lets me understand something. I know based on this data that I will have this many users next month, for example. But causality is a superpower. If I knew for a fact in Randy's restaurant that the number of reservations at 5 p.m. was causal of the number of total covers that night, all I would need to do to double the number of people in the restaurant is get 100 reservations instead of 50. And I get 500 people that night instead of 250. It's probably not the case, but it's not a bad thing to test. I mean, if Randy ran a promotion saying, if you make a reservation by 5 p.m., we'll throw in an extra cocktail, then he could look and see if it changed. It'd be very easy to devise that experiment. And then if it turned out that he had a causal relationship, he can pack his restaurant every night just by getting those reservations up, right? So causality is kind of a superpower. Most great marketing involves finding some kind of correlation, testing the causality, and if it's causal, optimizing the causal factor. You may have heard of growth hacking. That's all it is. Another important and somewhat related metric is leading versus lagging metrics. A leading metric is a number today that shows what's going to happen tomorrow. It makes the news. A historical metric kind of shows how you're doing, but it does so after the fact. So if I, for example, um, have a leading metric such as my pipeline for sales today, 
that's a leading indicator of what my sales will be like for the quarter, assuming that I'm getting normal sales conversion. To finance, however, the sales may be a leading indicator of collections because they may know that they're going to collect a certain percentage of sales. Now, let me make this a little more blunt for you if you're thinking about something like e-commerce. <clears throat> One of the most important things you can know if you're running an e-commerce business is whether you are in acquisition mode or loyalty mode. Acquisition mode means you go get customers. Loyalty mode means you keep customers. If you are selling diamond rings, and let's assume for a minute in the sanctity and wonderfulness and lifelong loyalty of marriage, and not be cynical, if you assume that you're going to buy one wedding ring for someone in your life, then wedding ring is an acquisition sale. You're going to buy it exactly once, and that merchant wants to get as much money from you as possible, all the guarantees, warranties, insurances you can get. They also want to get you to tell all your friends, all the referral they can, because you're only going to be there once. A grocery store is a loyalty-based model. I'd like you to come back every week. If you have some bad fruit from my loyalty store, I'm going to refund it happily and send you a fruit basket as an apology because I'm banking on your long-time loyalty to my store. If you don't like the wedding ring, I'm not giving you a refund. So there's a huge difference. Now, it turns out you can measure this really, really easily. If you're running an e-commerce store, what percentage of your users buy from you a second time in 90 days? If it's lower than 15%, you are an acquisition-focused company. Forget about loyalty metrics. Forget about wish lists. Forget about any kind of returning invites. Hey, you know, join our wedding ring of the month club. That sounds a little uncomfortable, right? On the other hand, if you're in a loyalty-focused business stuff, that makes a lot of sense, but you don't want to gouge people and have them have post-purchase dissonance. You want to build loyalty over time. If you don't know which one you're in, you're going to make horrible marketing decisions. And it's really, really easy to measure. Zappos is kind of in the middle, because they're selling shoes initially, and that kind of stuff is you don't buy shoes that often. Maybe some of you do. Um, loyalty is like an Amazon company, and then a wedding ring company is an acquisition. Your entire marketing strategy stems from whether or not you, what, what percentage of your customers buy from you a second time in the first 90 days. And yet, the number of companies I've talked to that actually look at this metric is astonishingly small. They're shooting from the hip. There are plenty of these leading indicators, such as this one. Um, this was a bunch of quotes from a growth hacking conference that happened last year. Um, Facebook found that if users reached seven friends within 10 days of signing up, they would become an almost lifelong user of the application. Dropbox user, if you put one file in a folder, you are likely to become a sustained user. Um, Twitter knew that if you followed a certain number of people and a certain percentage of those followed you back, within a certain time, you would become an engaged user. They wouldn't disclose those numbers, but you can bet that everything they do during the enrollment process is designed to get you to follow a certain number of people who are likely to follow you back. So these are some things you need to think about with metrics. Correlation, leading versus lagging, actionable, and so on. Now, we've talked a lot about experimentation so far. How do you understand what you're doing and run tests? And there are lots of different things you can do to experiment with your users. Because remember, as a startup, your job, or as a new product in a large organization, your job is not to make the product successful. Your job is to build a product to figure out what product to build. And I'll say that again. You're building a product to figure out what product to build. That way you won't fall in love with what you've built because its only role is to teach you what you should have built and that's a good thing. It's very uncomfortable for those of us that love to build things, right? We love to build this thing. We're proud of it. It's precious. It's our baby. We want to hug it. No. Our baby's job is to teach us what we should have done and die. That's a horrible, <laughs> uncomfortable thing. I may not be a great parent. My daughter says I am, but... Uh, um, so let me tell you some things about experimentation. And I'll tell you why this stuff matters so much. Imagine that you're running a site and these colorful bands represent the five months of users you've had. So the first month in light blue from left to right, and then the second batch and the third batch and the fourth batch. One slice through this over time is something called a cohort. So we're following users who joined us in the fourth month through their life cycle. And they have a different experience from users in their first month because the site is changing over time. So my product or my service is very different in the fourth month than it was in the first month. If I'm doing things right, I'm changing rapidly every week. So it would be unfair for me to analyze those users and the other users and commingle them. I've got to look at them as a unique group. Now, I might segment those users across all of my users. Say, show me all the users that arrived on a sunny day versus a cloudy day. That would be a segmentation of my users by some demographic or some aspect. I might even subject them to different conditions. So I might show them a red button versus a green button and see what happened. This is normally called A-B testing. 
Generally speaking, if you don't have a ton of traffic, what you're doing is you're doing something called multivariate analysis, where you're subjecting people to lots of different conditions, and then you're doing statistical regression to find out what combination of conditions provides you the best outcome and which factors influenced people doing what you like. This is the kind of analysis that analytics wonks and data scientists do. But it's very important to understand cohorts for simple business reasons. I'm going to show you two companies. Here's the first company. They close 1,000 a a thousand customers a month. In their first month, the average revenue per user is $5 a month. In the second month, it's $450, then it's $433, then it's $425, then it's $450 again. How many people here think this company is shrinking? How many people think it's growing? How many people think it's stagnating? How many of you don't like raising your arms? <laughs> That's a paradox. So um, most people look at this and they say, I'm not sure, but it kind of looks like it's stagnating. I mean, they're making five bucks a month per user. They're growing users, right? Here's another company. <clears throat> so in this company, um, the first users paid five bucks a month on average. And in the second month, they paid only three as they kind of left and so on. And then the third month, two, then one, then f 50 cents. And the next group, which started in February, came along. And they, uh, they went to six in their first month, so it was a little better. And the next group, seven in their first month. And the next group, eight, and now nine. How many people think this company is growing? It's pretty good, right? You went from $5 in your first month to $9 in your first month in just five months, and the drop off in revenue is better. These are the same company. If you do the math on these, what's happening is that that little 50 cents for the January cohort in its fifth month is polluting the huge success you've had for the customers in May. This is the same data. Let me put it a different way. If I line it up like this, now you start to see a much more useful pattern. Now you start to see that in the first month, we started at five, now we're at nine. On average, people spend seven in their first month. I have seen startups go to VCs and present data full of averages, and the VC says, get out of here, and the startup says, I'm doing really well, and the VC says, no, you're not, and they leave, and they wonder why no one signed a term sheet. The company was different on the fifth month from the first month, and yet for some weird reason, we treat it like averages. We commingle those five companies that we built, one new company every month, without learning from them. That's a horrible travesty of data. But the number of founders that understand the importance of cohorts versus simple averages is tiny. So enough yelling at people. Let me talk about the Lean Analytics framework. Uh, Eric Ries talks about three engines of growth in his uh, book, The Lean Startup. The three approaches he can use to grow companies are, first of all, stickiness, which basically means keep people coming back. Uh, and here you measure, can you get customers faster than you lose them? Pretty simple, right? I mean, this, by the way, this slide is like the simplest paraphrasing of all of Lean Startup you'll ever see. Virality, which is make people invite their friends, and the metric is how many people do they tell and how fast do they tell them. And then there's price, which is spend some money, some of the money you earn, getting new customers. And the measure here is do customers, uh, are customers worth more to you than they cost to get? And Eric says, look, you can use any one of these three models to grow your business. You can make people stick around, and then you just grad gradually add them and you'll grow. You can take some of the revenue you got and pour it back into ads and you'll grow. You can make your, friend, make your users tell their friends and you'll grow. Simple. So we said, okay, let's apply this to uh, the stages we think a company should go through, because we think they should go through all of these. At first, the company needs to go through empathy. Empathy means get inside your customer's head, understand the problem they're trying to solve, and understand whether they like the solution you're proposing to that problem. Those are two separate conversations. They're usually qualitative. At some point after that, you want to focus on stickiness. And stickiness is, do they stick around? Only once you know they'll stick around does it make sense to step on the gas of viral marketing and advertising. Because if I bring in a million users and none of them stick around, it was a huge waste of effort. And I probably don't get a second chance to make a first impression. Virality means I'm going to invite someone and they're going to tell other people. If I have a site where each person invites a half additional person, my cost of customer acquisition is lower because I'm getting an extra half a person every time I get somebody to join the site. So once I've got a decent viral coefficient and I've got a, people inviting others, then it makes time to pour some money into revenue that gets funneled back into advertising acquisition. And only then do I want to scale the business up. Scaling up means getting channels, worried about analysts, worried about trade shows, distancing myself from the customer, starting a franchise, whatever those things might be, to grow the scale of the organization. Once I've assured myself that I know a problem for a market that users will stick to, that they will tell their friends about, and that I can cost efficiently acquire new users. The other dimension of this is the business you're in. 
So we spent a lot of time, obviously there's an infinite number of uh, possible business models. We identified six sort of archetypical business models that apply online and also offline, but primarily online because of analytics, because this is where an people analyze a lot of stuff. But an e-commerce model translates just as well to a retail outlet where people are shopping, for example. There's an e-commerce model, there's a two-sided marketplace, which is like an eBay. Um, there's a software as a service model where you subscribe to something, could be cloud computing, could be hosted software like salesforce.com. There's mobile, pardon me, mobile applications where you either have subscriptions or in-game purchases. Um, there's user-generated co uh, content, pardon me, there's user-generated content which is like a Facebook or a Reddit. Um, it's also things like uh, Wikipedia um, where people go in and create the content themselves. Um, and then there's media sites where you make money off advertising. And the intersection of these two drives the metric that matters to your business. If you are a two-sided marketplace in the virality stage, there's a set of metrics you should really care about. And there's one in particular that is the most important metric in your business. And if you know that, then you run a series of optimizations to try and get it past some line in the sand that you've drawn, and you move on. This doesn't sound very sexy. It's a lot of hard work, but it's actually pretty disciplined. So let me give you an example of someone doing this at the empathy stage. Local Mind was one of the companies in Year One Labs. Um, they were acquired by Airbnb last year. Local Mind basically allowed you to ask questions about a place. So hey, is there good Wi-Fi in Times Square? Now if you want to test that, one of the biggest risks in their business was would strangers answer questions from strangers? And they could have built an app and they could have tried this out and instead they went on Twitter. And they basically looked at anybody who was tweeting from Times Square and they started asking them questions like, is there Wi-Fi there? Is it cold? What's a good restaurant near you? Where's the closest subway? And they found that like 90% of people would answer that question. I mean, I thought New Yorkers were obnoxious, but 90% of them would answer the question. So they took this thing that they thought was an element of risk and they ran an experiment using the minimum amount of work possible to verify whether that risk exists. And they knew if more than 80% of people would answer a question, then their business model assumptions were accurate. And it turns out it was over 90, so they had their line in the sand, they exceeded it, they moved on. Perfect. It turns out in Local Mind's case that the real risk, which they didn't know, was would people ask questions? And they didn't know that until they started building further on, but they had to sort of adjust their model and start seeding people's, when you first got the account, it would start asking you questions about the neighborhood and then it would start logging that data and learning from it. They didn't know that until they started, but they were able to identify pieces of risk and then do just the minimum work to overcome or quantify that risk. Here's a second example in the stickiness stage. Uh, WP Engine. So WP Engine is a web hosting, uh, WordPress hosting company. How many people here think uh, losing a quarter of your customers every year is bad? You're all wrong. Losing 2% of your customers a month is fine. In fact, it's really good. Salesforce manages like 1.7 churn. 2% a month churn is fine. Now, you're not alone. In this particular case, Jason Cohen, who runs WP Engine, was terrified that he was losing a quarter of his customers every year, too, and he was really, really thinking this is a bad thing, right? So he was doing everything he could to reduce churn, and he was getting hugely diminishing returns. What he should have been doing is saying, you know what, 2% a month is fine. I am going to make that up in affordable customer acquisition and in additional revenue from existing subscribers and viral marketing and so on. And when he stopped worrying about 2% because he was already good enough and he moved on to another metric like lowering customer acquisition costs, the business really took off. But if you don't know what good is in an industry, you have a real problem. In the stickiness stage, it turns out that for software as a service, 2% is good enough. And we talked to about 130 people over the course of writing this book. We talked to a bunch of companies that run software to analyze these things. We learned a lot of numbers. The answer is it depends. But I can tell you right now, if you get 90% or more of your users to come back every day, you're doing well for a user-generated content site. Reddit gets like 92%. If you get people on your site for 17 minutes or more a day, and it actually is 17, I know it sounds like a made-up number, 17 minutes or more a day, they're engaged. Facebook gets 60. So there are numbers like this. You can draw a line in the sand and say, I'm right at this number. If I move past that number, I'm doing well. You'll all get a book. In the book, there's a section for each of those six business models that says, here's some metrics and here's what's normal. I'll give you another example in the virality stage. So a company called Kiddick, one of the other companies in the Year One Labs uh, stable, basically had a model for asking people questions. I'd mail you a question and you would be invited to join this focus group and you'd install this mobile app and then you'd go and create an account and then you'd get the question and you'd answer it. Pretty simple, right? So Kiddick's initial design 
was pretty onerous. I'm going to create this group. I'm going to send you all an invite. You all install the app. How many of you, if I sent you an email right now, you'd install an app and answer that question? Got enough apps on your phone? Yeah. So they were getting, at best, 10 to 25% response rate, which is pretty good for a survey, but it's not great. And then they, in a little bit of desperation, said, we got to fix this. What if we moved everything that doesn't need to be done until later? So that part about creating an account, I'm not going to do that. And their epiphany was, if I send you an invite and you click on the answer that you want to give me, that's good enough to say we had a, an agreement and you, know, you agreed to join this group. If you don't know what your password is on a website, what do you do? Password recovery, right? So what if I just don't tell you your password until you do a recovery? So they tried that. They said, hey, um, the survey owner is going to add the recipient to the group, ask a question. You get an email. In that email, there's three or four links. You click on the one you want. What do you want for dinner? Fish or rice. You click. That's it. Next thing you see is the vote. It's for me. That's fine. And then later on, if you want to, and it'll show you the results. Later on, if you want to log in and create your own quiz or whatever, or ask your own question, you got to go do password recovery. But that's okay, right? So push all that stuff later. Oh, look, 70 to 90% conversion rate. Because they moved all this crap later. They didn't love the product on the left. They realized the product on the left was an experiment. And by looking at the abandonment rate and looking at where people dropped off in that cycle, they were able to iterate and pivot to go from a 10 to 25% open rate to a 70 to 90% open rate. Huge. Let's look at the revenue stage. So Backupify. Backupify is a company that does online backups for technology. And over time, they switched their metric from the early stuff around stickiness and attention to more important metrics around um, revenue. So early on, they focused on how many visitors they had to their site. When they got that to a number they liked, then they focused on how many of those people tried something out. When the trial metric was good enough, then they focused on signups. When signup was good enough, they focused on, multi, uh, on monthly recurring revenue. What they found early on was that their cost to acquire a customer was $233. Their average revenue per user was $39. This is not a good business model. So they decided to target business users. They found that business users had much more loyalty, were less likely to change. Lower customer acquisition costs, believe it or not, much greater revenue per user, and the customer lifetime value, which is the total money a customer brings in over time, to their customer acquisition cost is about five to six times. So they make back five to six times what they invested in a car and customer. <clears throat> Just so you know, the target number you should be shooting for is less than a third. You should never spend more than a third of your customer's lifetime value on acquiring that customer. Now they track something called customer acquisition payback, which is how many months does it take me to pay back my customers? Meaning if I spend money acquiring them, how many months until I've rec recovered the money it costs to acquire them? And their goal is less than a year. Interestingly, if you're a founder, this tells you exactly how much money you need from the bank. Because this is how much money you're loaning customers to have gone and acquired them and wait for them to pay you back. If you walk into a VC or an angel and say, I need this much money, they say, why? You say, because that's how much my customer acquisition times my growth projections are, they'll go, wow, you've done your math. You're so much more reliable because you actually understand the numbers. What all these things have in common is black screen. No, what all these things have in common is something we call the lean analytics cycle. This is an iterative model that is pretty obvious in hindsight, but not a lot of people follow. First, you start out by picking a key performance indicator. You're one metric that matters for where you are as a business. You draw a line in the sand. I want to be over 80% responses. I want to see less than 30% of my total spend on food uh, or my total spend on the restaurant going to staffing, whatever that line in the sand is. Then I find a potential improvement. Now that improvement might be something I made up. Usually it's something I stole from my competitor or best practice. I'm going to make all the links blue and see what happens, that kind of stuff. Or it can be something I find within the data. I'll come back to an example of that in a minute. But I might mine the data and find that all the users that are doing what I want them to do have something in common. Whatever that is, I now have a hypothesis. Let's say I find that all the users who come from Twitter tend to stick around longer. And sticking around longer is the metric I want to improve. Maybe I run a campaign focusing on Twitter because I've analyzed that stuff. Then I make changes. I can either do it in production if I'm gutsy, or I can run some kind of a test, A-B testing. I measure the results, and I ask myself, did I actually move the needle? I know this is a horribly mixed metaphor about lines in the sand and moving the needle, but you get what I mean. Um, if it was good, great, success, I move on, right? If it was horribly bad and I've lost my patience or funding, I pivot or I give up. 
If I didn't make it, <clears throat> but I think I need to draw a new line in the sand, it's okay to do so. But only if the customer tells you why. A company called High Score House was measuring um, engagement by users. They expected an engaged user to be a family that used this application once a day. They went and looked at engagement. They were not getting there. They were trying, they were trying, they were trying. Finally, they called users and said, you're not using it. And the users said, no, we're using it all the time. Every Saturday morning, we sit down with the family and use the app. And they heard this over and over again. They went, oh, we drew the line in the sand wrongly. People are using the app differently. Now, that informed their design of app because now they could sort of, say, plan for the week and they could put in weekly features. It also meant they could draw a new line in the sand saying, do they use it at least once a week? And suddenly, they're doing much better. And finally, if you have lots of patients, you can keep going. You can try again and keep iterating through this stuff. But this cycle of running an experiment and trying to improve seems pretty obvious. And yet, it's the thing that's at the core of organizations that are constantly learning. They're constantly forming hypotheses and trying to learn from them. So the question that many of you face, regardless of what kind of business you are, is what is your one metric that matters? In the empathy stage, that's usually things like doing interviews, finding qualitative information, and so on. Now, depending on the business model, I'm not going to make you read the eye chart, but depending on the business model, if you're in e-commerce, you're going to focus early on on things like loyalty, maybe a little bit of conversion. Later on, you care about like white label marketing, customer lifetime value if you're in the loyalty space. <coughs> Two-sided marketplaces are also making money from transactions. So these two are very similar. They both make money from transactions. But in a two-sided two marketplace, you care about things like, do I have enough inventory of listings? If you're a uh, for sale by owner housing market, for example, you care about, do I have enough listings that when people search for something, they're finding one or more results? In the software as a service business, you care about churn and things like that early on. Later on, you care about, am I upselling people to a higher tier of service? What's my customer lifetime value and acquisition cost? In the mobile app, I care about things like average revenue per daily active user and other uh, metrics. Um, in user-generated content, I care about things like content, spam, invite volume. Later on, I care about things like uh, how much sharing, how many donations, how much ad revenue I'm getting. In media, I care about traffic and visits because that's my ad inventory. Later on, I care about my cost per click. It's a lot of data. And the challenge for many people is how do you choose only one metric? So I said only one metric, and I do mean one metric, because that metric will change very, very quickly. In a startup, the hardest thing to achieve is focus. It's harder than anything else. It's so easy to get distracted by South by Southwest, or the shiny new blog, or Reddit, which is the bane of my existence. Having only one metric really addresses this problem. Try it sometime. Pick one metric you're going to optimize, and focus the whole company on moving the number until it gets to a certain point. If you can't move it to where you think it needs to be according to your business model, your business model is fundamentally flawed. If you can move it, it will be immediately evident what metric you need to fix next. Let's say you move it so you have the site traffic you want. Next metric is conversion. If you move it to conversion, it'll be sales volume. Sales volume will be satisfactory buyer metrics, some other metric, because metrics are like squeeze toys. When you optimize one metric, the next metric bulges out, asking to be optimized. Focusing on one metric at a time is huge. Choosing the metric properly is what's really hard. <coughs> so I'll end with this thought. Um, Archimedes had taken baths before. I've got a little ADD, I may admit to it. Um, so everybody knows the story of Archimedes. The king said, I think I got ripped off. There's this gold crown. I don't think it's full, fully gold. I don't think it's 24 karat gold. Could you please measure the density of an irregularly shaped solid? The king probably didn't use those words, but that's what Archimedes heard. And he went home to think about it. He drew himself a nice long bath, and he sat down in the bath and noticed the water went up. And he went, oh, Eureka, I've got it. Displacement. I can measure the volume of an irregular solid, and from that I can calculate density. And the story goes, he ran down the street naked going, Eureka. The reality is probably that he didn't do that. He was much more scientific. He probably took a scale and dunked something in and used that to measure it. But the idea is still the same. Because there was nothing special about that bath. What was special is that the king had asked him the right question. Being asked the right question, coming up with the experiment is easy. I mean, he figured it out pretty fast. He's a smart guy, but he figured it out pretty fast. Knowing what question to ask is the really difficult part. Once you know that question, you can focus on going to answer, going to answer it. For decades in business, the leader has been the person who convinced others to act in the absence of data. You've all heard of big data. We live in this data-driven economy. For years, the leader was the person who was most convincing. 
It was John Hamm in Mad Men saying, remember the carousel, these lights on the wall and the projector turning and all your memories of childhood. And everyone in the room's like, oh, John, I'm crying. This is awesome. John Hamm is a proxy for a market he couldn't know. The person who got ahead in the business was the person who convinced others to act in the absence of data. That is fundamentally changing from the smallest startup to the biggest business in the world. <coughs> because today, the real issue is the leader knows which questions to ask. And that is the hardest problem. And that's the answer I can't give you. I can tell you all the other stuff. But figuring out, based on what stage you're at, based on what, what kind of business you're in, what the one metric that matters in that's most risky to your business right now that you need to quantify and either understand or de-risk or overcome, and how to run a series of experiments to move that metric to where it needs to be so you can move ahead, is all it takes to build a successful business. The trouble is it's not very glamorous, it's a lot of hard work, it requires a lot of discipline and focus. But if you can do those things, if you can figure out what question to ask given who and what your business is, then you have a much, much higher chance of succeeding. So I've got about 10 minutes to take questions. That's Ben, that's me. I'm happy to uh, answer any and all questions you have about the subject. Hopefully I didn't saturate your brain too much, but thank you all. So questions, yes. Uh, I just had a question. Um, our startup is right at this stage, so this is an important question. <laughs> um, how would you uh, evaluate the face-to-face, -face what what we're calling streeter interviews, right. where you see the smile, and and you can't possibly, given that you're a small startup, do a great volume, compared to an online survey that you maybe can get higher volume, but maybe the... Sure, so you absolutely need to do both. Um, there's actually a lot of stuff in the book, I didn't get into it here, on the empathy stage. Um, but the reality is, you are gonna do a lot of conversations with people. It's very important to separate the finding the needs from validating your solution. One of the things people love to do is, I have this thing, I can't wait to tell you about it. When someone came along and built the Walkman or the minivan, they didn't say, would you like a minivan or would you like a Walkman? In fact, all the stuff they talked to people about said, I don't want this. What they said was, people are spending more time on public transit and want some time to themselves. Or weekends are turning into mom or dad is the activity taxi. People are moving to the suburbs. <clears throat> all those trends led them to a set of needs. Then they built the minimum viable product, tested it out, and lo and behold, it worked, right? So it's very important to say, I'm going to test the need. I'm going to find a need. Then I'm going to test the solution to that need and see if that's real. And you can do those qualitatively early on. Later on, you look at the most common responses from your qualitative data and you make surveys based on that, but always leave the open-ended what if. So you generally want to survey for demographic data, gender, age, income, all that stuff. The questions you're asking, how do you think about buying scarves from the Bay? <clears throat> and then the last thing being uh, open-ended. So tell me what you think. And the person may go, I hate scarves. How dare you ask me that, right? Um, it's very, very hard to conduct a good survey that isn't leading. If I said to you, this book is awesome, agree, disagree, I'm going to get a very different answer from this book is terrible, agree, disagree. So it's vital that you be um, clear in your surveys. Surveys are super easy to do these days. Doing them well is still difficult, but they are so cheap that it's almost stupid not to do them. Um, High Score House, one of the things they did early on um, was they ran a bunch of Google ads and in the Google AdWords, they, they, they knew they were going to build something for parents, but they didn't know what it was going to be. So they weren't sure would it be you know, managing your kid's diet or how to handle the handoff of kids between divorced parents or managing chores and rewards or how to track sleep time or whatever. And they ran a whole bunch of Google AdWords ads that were like, do you have a problem getting your kids to eat healthy food? Click here to take this survey. Or are you a harried single mom who really wants to make sure that your, her husband is following the same rules of the kids, click here to let us know how, and so on. And what they found was they were able to measure which taglines drove the most traffic, so yay, you found your slogan. They were able to measure which uh, forms got the most completion, which measures a degree of commitment to this question. They were able to solicit email addresses of people who would agree to be forum users or beta users, and then they were able to use, get those people to be testers and measure what they did. And they had all the data from the form they filled in. Cost them about 300 bucks. So if you're not doing that, you need your head checked. Like that's just free money, right? 
because you can test all this stuff very, very easily. Google even has a thing called consumer surveys now. Trivially easy. Facebook, you can target all this stuff by demographics. So using that kind of tool to get initial qualitative stuff by spraying and seeing what, what takes is a very useful uh, step once you've had 30 or more initial interviews. Uh, talk to at least 30 people. It's a good rule of thumb. And early on, you just want to count, like, what was it like? Also, another good rule of thumb is to bring someone with you and have them observe body language um, and leave one of the most important things. And this is funny. For the people in the room that know me, this sounds like something I would never say. The single best thing in an interview is awkward silence. See how awkward that is? Everyone wants to fill the space, right? Just lots of that. Because people will they'll be so, this is uncomfortable, i got to fill it. And usually that's when they say stuff they didn't really realize they knew. Okay. Thanks. Um, great presentation. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, at what point do you, as a, an entrepreneur or business owner, decide that you need to move more towards profitability and not letting that be the key metric that everything is you're optimizing for profitability all the time and kind of basically moving from growth mode to a more focused on profit? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the, the short answer, uh, hi David, by the way, I recognize yep. you from Twitter. Yeah. Um, the short answer is uh, when you can't pay your mortgage. Um, because that, that really is it. Like, <clears throat> at some point you go, I gotta, like, I know one of the companies we talked to, uh, Buffer, they, um, they're an uh, online Twitter service, not Buffer Box, but Buffer, they were like a uh, uh, system where you could queue up tweets and stuff. The guy's like, look, we had to get to ramen profitability. That was his word for the minimum I could live on, was ramen profitability. And so that influenced a lot of the design. That's just a business necessity. There's one problem with that, which is that <clears throat> if you look at a traditional, I mean, people, everybody here understand price elasticity, this idea that if I charge more, I'll sell less. If I charge less, I'll sell more. So there's an optimal price to volume that brings in most revenue. What you generally want to do as a startup is be like 10% to the left, meaning 10% more volume than the optimal price revenue. So generally, you want to be right on that line if you're trying to maximize revenues. As a startup, because you're in growth mode, you want to solve for more users rather than for maximum revenue. And so what you're really talking about is striking a balance between volume of number of users and uh, amount of money, right? Now, you may find that you change your business model and it actually leads to more money. Sometimes that happens. Um, one of the examples that Ben had, um, a company he worked with that did um, uh, hiring and recruiting was charging like 10 bucks a month for people to use this recruiting service and no one was using it. And in desperation, they said, we're just going to charge $300 a listing. Sales went through the roof, right? Because people just wanted to pay 300 bucks once and not to worry about it. The business, the job is listed. Nobody wanted the commitment of $10 a month. No one's going to stick around for 30 months for a job listing. I mean, economically, that made no sense. But it worked, and their revenues went through the roof because they were desperate for profit. So, you know, the, the single best test of whether somebody really likes what you're doing is they're going to pay you enough money for you to eat. Um, the challenge is really striking that balance between price elasticity, right? Maximizing revenues versus being a little, and, and when I say to the left of the curve, if you look at those traditional curves, a few more users at a slightly lower price. Most people say 10% to the left. Uh, there's a really good book called Don't Just Roll the Butt Dice by Neil Davidson. Uh, it's a free ebook. It's like 60 pages, and it talks a lot about profitability and revenue and so on. So I, I don't know if that's an answer, but usually how much ramen you have in your, in your pantry is a good indicator of profitability. All right, if there's anything else, or if you want to chat, I'm going to be around for a few more minutes. I have to get running. Yeah. I have one um, sure. other question. How do you, um, in advertising, when you do a, a lot of research, you give people permission. There's a moderator and a group, and you allow people to, to give them permission to be honest, basically. Mm -hmm. But, but how do you do that when you're doing either one-on-one -on -one or an online survey? There's a great book by Jonathan Haidt called um, uh, The Righteous Mind. And he has this great line. He says, anybody who's, anybody who's searching for truth should abandon reason. He says, we did not evolve to be right. We evolved to have the approval of our peers because that's what got us fed and protected. Humans are terrible at rationalizing, at understanding data, at making rational decisions. So you have to give people uh, a safety valve, an out. And one of the best ways to do it is these kind of proxy sessions. I'll give you guys a great um, example of how bad we are at data. Um, I have two kids. At least one of them is a girl. What are the chances the other child is a girl? Fifty percent. How many people think fifty percent? The rest of you are just not putting your hand up because you don't. You know I'm tricking you, right? It turns out that it's thirty-three percent. So I'll explain why. There's four possibilities, right? There's boy-girl, 
girl, boy, 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 girl, girl. Four possibilities. I told you at least one is a girl. That eliminates boy, boy. What are the chances that the other one is? Boy, girl, girl, boy, girl, girl. There's a 66% chance the other one's a boy. Everybody gets that wrong, even statisticians. It's a stupid problem. It's a Bayesian, a Bayesian math problem. Unless you've done stats, and even then a lot of statisticians get it wrong. We are terrible at data. Like absolutely terrible. Uh, I'll give you one more quick example. Um, in the US, broadcast radio, when it, when it started, needed to pay its way through advertising. And the way they measured advertising was something called the Arbitron Diary. This little book that they gave to people. So for example, I'm going to go find 100 Hispanic males between 20 and 35 and I'm going to give them a book. I'll tell them to write down what they listen to on a daily basis. And then they'll turn that in at the end of the month and I'll use that to price advertising. Oh, you want to reach 100,000 Hispanic males in this demographic? This is the station. This is what it costs. The entire commercial radio industry ran that way until 2007. As a result of this, the stations learned how to game it. So they would run a contest at 825. Because that way you had to write down that you were listening from 815 to 820, uh, 830 and 830 to 845, which was the coveted blocks. They'd always run the contest at 825. They'd run more contests at the end of the week. Because that meant that people who were lazy and filled in their diaries on Saturday would remember that that was the station they were listening to. And they would do those annoying, you're listening to KRO, KRO, K, over and over again. That wasn't for your benefit, that was for the benefit of the people keeping diaries. In 2007, this changed because Arbitron came out with something called the PPM. And the PPM was a personal performance meter, little pager-sized thing on your hip. Every radio station you listen to today has an inaudible tone. You can't hear it, but the PPM can, whether it's streamed live, only live streaming, or uh, broadcast. The PPM knows what you listen to. If you walked into a mall and listened to country music, it knows you listen to a country and western station for 20 minutes, even if you don't. Stations, this had, an, uh, th this was, uh, the big stations tried to block this on the grounds of human rights. They said this is going to lead to racism. They came up with anything they could. They went to Congress to try and block it. Stations that had 50% market share crumbled to 30. Because what we actually do is very different from what we think we do. So the PPM on our hips led to all these weird behaviors. Because now I know what radio, what song makes you change the channel. So we take things out of rotation if they're bad much more quickly. Most disappointingly, 20 years ago, if a song was in heavy rotation, it got played four times, uh, sorry, once every four hours. Today that song gets played once every 55 minutes. If you want to know why pop radio sucks, that's why. What happens when we have accurate data destroys industries. It's very hard to get people to tell you the truth. They want to tell you what they think they want to hear. They want to tell you what they think makes them look cooler to you. I know people that dress in nondescript clothing. I know people that purposely don't eat at a coffee meeting because if I said I'm going to order a vegetable sandwich, they might think they're a vegetarian and answer green. Huge problems. So the science of getting accurate information, it can be done, but it's very, very difficult to do well. Um, there's another book in the Lean Startup series called Running Lean by Ash Moira. And he uh, goes into quite a lot of the customer development stage on how to do this stuff. There's a bit of it in our book, too. Sorry, it's a bit of an anecdote, but there you go. <coughs> Rambling stories. All right, I'm going to be here for a few more minutes. If you have other questions, come on up and say hi. Thank you all very much for coming, and uh, drive safely on the way home if it's still snowy out there. Looks better, though. <laughs>